of the event is to share insight, advice, and best practice from industry insiders, so that it so that you can harness the right cloud solutions to you know help your business become more sustainable. Now, we keep hearing in the news about emissions of the aviation industry, which accounts for around 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I guessed that the IT and cloud industry was significant, but it did take me by surprise when I found out that we are on par and also contribute a similar 2% gas emissions as well. Now, I did you predict that investment in digital will outstrip GDP by a factor of three. What this means is rather than reduce your footprint, like most organizations, you may increase your emissions instead. You also may have seen the BBC Panorama program, Is the Cloud Damaging the Planet? Now, even though uh, it took a simplified view of the issues, one thing is for certain. It's now creeping into the psyche of the public and they are turning their attention on our sector. And as responsible people, we need to do our fair share to develop solutions. But when you take into consideration the cost crunch, the pressure to do more with less, the IT community are really having to make hard choices. And in many cases, the green agenda takes a backseat. Not any longer. So our topic today is be sustainable without destroying your bottom line. The simple proposition is that with careful choices, you can uh, reduce your, uh, your footprint at the same time as uh, in, in, you know, improving your IT infrastructure. And you may also be wondering why we're talking about this now. Well, OVH and, uh, is one of VMware's largest European partner. And we are in the game of bringing groundbreaking propositions to market. And one of the main reasons we are confident with our alliance is that we have a meeting of minds on sustainability uh, and how to drive change in the industry. And that's what this session is all about. We have three subject matter experts from this industry that know what it takes to deliver digital projects to budget whilst improving the emissions in the process. And they're here to offer you practical insights and tips that have produced results for them in the past. You're in charge today. Take this opportunity to drive the direction of our discussion. Just submit your questions in the chat function and we'll do our best to answer them. Also, on the fun side, we are gearing up for Easter. And one thing we associate with these holidays is chocolate. So throughout the session, session you get... Uh, Fascinating insight from our resident chocolatier, Nick. So think of today as being an Easter egg hunt with sustainability clues lighting the way. So we have a packed agenda. And now to our panel, folks, I'm going to ask each of you to do a short intro and share an interesting anecdote that highlights to you the importance of sustainability to you personally or your company. And let's start with the chocolate specialist, Nick. Hello. Well, thank you so much for letting me join you. And yeah, as you say, my, my mission here is to make this as fun as possible and make it uh, and give you a great experience. But also what I represent is, uh, is a co company called Coca Runners. And we're at the forefront of what we call the craft chocolate revolution, which is all about making our chocolate consumption more ethical and sustainable, driven by a pursuit of fantastic flavor. And so we're going to try some sustainable and ethical bars uh, in the tasting kits you've got today. Uh, and hopefully it's going to dovetail really nicely into the themes that, that everyone else is going to talk about at this webinar. And I should say I'm also going to be the slide wrangler for the session today. Um, and I've got, I'll, I'll put slides up on the screen that will let people interact with the session. I'm going to pop something up now that people can start thinking about while other people introduce themselves. Um, so the slide in front of everyone now is uh, hopefully uh, showing a QR code which will let people interact with the session today. So all of the lovely panelists are going to ask you lots of questions and get your thoughts about topics as we go through. If you scan that QR code, or if you go to any browser you have on a phone or a tablet and put in that eight-digit code, that will let you interact with the sessions as, as we go through. 
So I'd say one of a couple of eager beers already there. Um, so yeah. I'll, uh, I'll take this. I'll put that information in the chat as well. So while other people make introductions, um, the code will be in the chat for things. That's great, Nick. Okay, David, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Terra. I'm uh, director and chair of something called the Cloud Industry Forum, which is a not for profit organization. Uh, membership organization industry trade body that uh, that advocates um, and promotes the use of cloud technology. Um, I haven't got so much of an, an anecdote uh, about it, but but for me, um, the importance of this topic, it, it's a numbers game. I mean, we as human beings, we've been around on the planet for 200,000 years. It took us till 1804 to get to a billion, um, 123 years to get to the next billion. Then it's it's ramped up and ramped up and ramped up. Now now we seem to be adding a billion every every eleven or so years. We we got to eight billion last year. And if you just kind of plot that on a graph and think about what we're all consuming and making, you understand how important sustainability is. I was at the um, uh, tech tech show London uh, Cloud Expo Europe two weeks ago. A lot of us uh, a lot of us might have been there too. Um, I, I was doing a couple of presentations and chairing a couple of uh, panel sessions, but I think the one topic that, that topped out was sustainability, closely followed by security, but sustainability, I think, was the number one thing people were talking about. Wow. Okay, so across to you, Rory. Thanks, Kuldeep. Thanks, David. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rory Chowdhury, and I am Solutions Marketing Director for Cloud uh, at VMware and uh, Kuldeep, you are our best European partner by far. Nobody else does a chocolate tasting, so you win. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my day job is really about talking to customers across the region, understanding what's driving their business decisions and particularly their decisions around the use of cloud and the level of mix of cloud with on-premises what's going into cloud and what's staying on premises. And, and I'm seeing a real shift in that discussion. Eight, 10, 12 years ago, we were talking about it from a cost point of view. I think there's enough intelligence out there now to understand that that uh, you know, is, is not a cost-driven discussion anymore. It's more about control. It's about uh, access to services. It's about the ability to scale. And increasingly, I'm hearing what both Kuldeep and David have referenced. I'm hearing a reference to how much carbon are we actually putting out there? Um, again, as Kuldeep said, you know, we are rapidly catching, as an industry, rapidly catching the aviation industry, and we will surpass it, no question. So um, for me, this journey started in earnest about eight years ago. Uh, for reasons that I don't truly understand, I decided to get an electric car. It wasn't the decision then that it is today. Today, there's frankly almost no reason not to. But back then, with a car that on a good day had a range of about 80 miles, uh, it was a little bit more risky. But what it did was drive me down a path. Um, and, and that sort of uh, then opened my eyes to how we were using resources at home, how we were using them at work. And, and it kind of uh, snowballed from there. You'll be happy to know I still drive uh, an, an EV, but um, it has significantly more than 80 miles of range, uh, even on a bad day. Back to you, Kuldeep. Okay, and uh, at one point you're going to have to tell us what car you did buy, whether that was a Tesla or another. Uh, over to you, Gregory. You're on mute. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, good. Thank you, Kuldeep. So I'm Gregory. Um, I've been working within OVH Cloud for the last five years. Um, I'm the Environmental Programs Director at OVH Cloud, meaning that my day-to-day -day job is to, to design and implement OVH Cloud's environmental strategy. Um, so my connection to the environmental topics, I'm more than 50, right? And I'm a graduate engineer. So if I remember my good old times when I was at the university, it was the first time that they opened a class dealing with ecology. Out of 120 uh, soon to be graduated engineers, there were only three of us interested by the topic. And then I started to work and they told me, oh, you know, green stuffs, why not? But they are expensive. And now what I can see is that not only we have to do it, this is mandatory, but it's not that expensive. 
And you know, the economical agenda and the environmental agenda are merging. And, and you can kill two birds with one stone easily. So here we are, and uh, let's jump on it. Brilliant, okay. So, thank you very much, everyone. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion uh, to our first chocolate tasting. So it's time that Nick takes us through a chocolate. We're also going to put up a question on screen. So while you're learning about the chocolate, think about the polling question um, and give us the answer. Uh, it'll be on your mobile that you can answer while you're uh, loving the flavor of the chocolate. So the first question, Nick, if you put that up there, uh, it's do you have an internal mandate from the top of your organization to hit sustainability targets? So four options, yes, no, not clear, don't know. Please do that on your mobile phone. And over to you, Nick. Cool, brilliant. Um, so yeah, so uh, just a quick reminder, any slide where you can answer a question will have the codes on the top. Um, so if you lose your place and you need to come back, that's fine. And if you don't, if you need a moment to think about it, that slide will stay there while we talk about other stuff and you can go back and answer and we'll check the answers at the end. So people are already busy answering, so have a think about that. Um, but we're going to start talking about chocolate. Um, and as I said, what I represent is what we call the craft chocolate revolution. We're fundamentally changing how we think about chocolate. And if I were to ask you when you most recently ate chocolate, it would probably be today. And if it wasn't today, it was probably within the last three days. Um, and there's lots of statistics on that and when people get their chocolate. But we don't really know how to eat chocolate. And I'd wager you probably ate your most recent piece of chocolate by just sort of shoveling it into your face really quickly. And you didn't give it much thought and you didn't particularly care about where it came from or anything like that. It just gave you a kind of sugar boost and tasted really nice. And that's fine as well, of course, but there's a lot more to it that we're missing. So we're going to do a quick uh, intro on how to taste chocolate to get the most out of it. We're going to use as our practice chocolate the Pump Street Grenada 70% that you've got in your kit. Now, in your kits, you should have the taster version. David's very kind and be holding up the display there. It's the little kind of papery bag with a blue label on the front. The window here is not doing me any favors, but um, Pump Street Grenada, 70%. I'm gonna talk through the steps that we can use to maximize our enjoyment of it. And it's very similar to how wine tasting works. If you've ever been to a wine tasting, you'll know that there's a very established process and ritual for how to do it. And a lot of it's very similar to uh, how we should ever find chocolate. The first thing you do with a bottle of wine is you look at the label, who grew the grapes, who made the wine, all that sort of stuff. And there's stuff on a chocolate label, and for, not this one because it's a taste of kit, unfortunately, but, um, but generally we should be looking at our chocolate labels. But in terms of our senses, the big important thing we can do is open up the packaging and smell our chocolate. In the same way you would swirl a glass of wine around and really sniff and savor those aromas, do that now with your chocolate. Now you can't swirl your chocolate unless you have stored it in really a really poor manner but it should you should be able to sniff the bar itself um, and you know chocolate's not as aromatic as wine but there's lots of aroma trapped in the packaging as well so if you get your little bag and really get your snout in there and really sniff it up and be really deliberate and fill your nostril with aroma and you might be connecting all sorts of food memories and start anticipating the flavor but it's an important part of what flavor is is to smell things please your homework is to go away and sniff and smell all your foods and drinks from now on. I promise you it's worth it. And we're going to have a taste now, our first taste of this chocolate, but it, there comes a little catch. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something very silly, and then we can all watch the panelists to make sure they're doing it, but everyone else at home is, uh, is, is free from this. But I'd like you to take a piece of chocolate, a little square or whatever, and as you put it in your mouth, hold your nose. Okay, you're going to clap your nose shut and let the chocolate melt in your mouth. I mean, I'm going to let, I haven't got any chocolate, so I'm going to go in my nose. You can breathe through your mouth. You don't have to hold your breath, but don't let air connect your mouth and your nose together. Now, as that chocolate melts, and it shouldn't need much encouragement to do so, you're experiencing what we call the upfront, which is your sort of primary reaction to the, the initial aspect of the chocolate. It's the physical feeling of the chocolate in your mouth. It's the taste buds on your tongue categorizing its chemistry as sweet or bitter or salty or whatever. Um, but this is different than what we call flavor, which is far more complex and far more interesting. And this is a thing that takes time to emerge. And what I'd like you to do is once you're happy that the chocolate is melted, 
let go of your nose and breathe in through your mouth and out through your nose. And you always want the air going that way around. And as you do that, what I hope you may have caught a glimpse of is that this suddenly the chocolate got a little bit more interesting. Suddenly there was just something more going on in maybe a way that's a bit hard to sort of understand or articulate. But if you've detected that, you've experienced the difference between taste and flavor. Now flavor, we like to talk about as being this wave, this journey that you go on. And it's the relationship between smell and taste jumbled up in your brain simultaneously, filtered through your memories and your emotions and all sorts of different things. Um, and in your tasting kit, you should have a picture of a wave that will help you visualize this. You're taking time to go on this journey and experience all these complex interactions of chemicals, allow your brain to sort through and understand all of it. And that is what flavor is. And chocolate just so happens to be the most chemically complex food in the world and gives us the greatest opportunity to understand all these flavors if it's been made with exceptional quality and if uh, we're willing to go and spend time and look for it. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I won't, I won't uh, poll people on how they feel about uh, that chocolate, but I'll go back to the poll that, uh, uh, that you've been asked today um, and see if there's some room for discussion on that one. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. Um, now I've got chocolate on my lecture. I'm going to have to uh, bite down on it eventually. Um, <laughs> at, least, at least Nick didn't ask us to spit it out like wine afterwards. Yeah. Oh, no, no, so, be, that's, what a waste of chocolate. No way. Yeah, exactly. That's not going to happen. Not on my watch. Um, okay, it looks like we're, we're getting a, a, a sort of a consensus. There's a little bit more than half that are saying yes, they have had an internal mandate from the top, and then there's a significant mono, minority, would you call that, that have said no, there isn't, but there is no not clear or don't know, so that tells the story in itself. Um, David, you mentioned that you went to Cloud Expo, I was there, it was pretty much on everybody's lips, sustainability in one form or another, it took part in every conversation I had. Uh, what's the Cloud Industry Forum view of, uh, view of it? Well, it's interesting. We, we, we literally, every, every year we do uh, um, a research project and we publish a report um, for, for our members. And we, we just, um, we, we got the data from this year's report uh, uh, um, about um, two weeks ago. And I, I just got the first draft of what the report might look like uh, literally this morning. So, Nick, could you uh, put the first one of my slides up, please? So, I, interestingly, the, the sample that, that we um, uh, uh, have got, 42% um, of them say that they are cloud first. 55% of them say that they're doing some sort of hybrid multi-cloud approach. And 2% are still on-premise. On, on so that just sets the scene in terms of, of the sample. But we asked them, how important is ESG and sustainability when you're deciding on vendors? And 82% said it's important obviously that that's um 52 percent uh very important and 32 percent extremely important as you can see on this uh this, this pie chart so it's it's suddenly come to very important in the mind can we move on to the next slide please nick so the next thing we asked them was, would you reject a cloud vendor if, if they gave a poor response on, on ESG sustainability? And here the numbers are 47% uh, um, and 38% and, um, and, and, um, and um, so they're serious about this and they actually would reject a, a, a vendor that hasn't got a, a good story on, on this topic. And, and I think that, you know, we've reached a point where um, people have been playing lip service uh, to, to this this topic, now they're getting serious about it, which I think is really good. However, put on the next slide, please, Nick. One of the downsides is, you know, are we really practicing that mindset? And and the reality is that when you say uh, which of the following priorities are the most important to your organisation when thinking about working with a cloud or man a managed service supplier, actually price comes to the top. Service is available next trust next their ability to scale next and then sustainability um comes out fifth in, in the sequence it's up from seventh from our last year's uh report so, so, so things are imp improving 
Um, but when it comes to the crunch, it's not uh, quite as important as, as, as uh, uh, what I might believe about the topic, which is a shame. Okay. Um, well, at least uh, it's, it's, we, we all have experienced it going up the priority stack. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. Yeah. Rory, what, what's your take on it from VMware's perspective? I think what's, what's been very interesting, you know, look, particularly looking at the numbers that, that David's uh, just thrown up there, is the shift over the last year, and particularly over the last, you know, well, particularly over the last year, but over the last n years, shall we say? I agree. When I first started on this, um, I was the lunatic raising sustainability in presentations to customers, <laughs> you know, where I was supposed to be talking about virtualization and cloud and Hang on, what does carbon have to do with it? Um, and, and, you know, going from that as a starting point um, eight years ago when I first started having those conversations, I think what's really interesting is that we're seeing um, it, it just, the, the, the topic is organically raised and it's, it's never by me. It comes up in discussion, customers are raising it. You know, there was an interesting spread in, in the poll of, of how many people have a mandate versus those that don't. But almost irrespective of that, the conversation is happening. Um, people are asking about it. People are conscious of it. It's in the press. It's in the news. It's on the TV. It's in on radio. There are, you know, n number of podcasts about it. And for me, that's the most exciting piece. Yes, there's an awful, awful long way to go. And Gregory's probably going to give us some um, really good estimates and, and, and scientific information around it. Um, but you know what? I'm just encouraged that we're actually talking about it and I'm no longer seen as the nutter in the corner. <laughs> okay, no more nutters in corners. I think that's the take from here, Gregory. So what's your take on this? Yeah, thank you, Kuldeep. So uh, what, what I can comment on is that you've been talking about the customer's behavior. And I can really witness that they are very intrusive in the way they want to assess OVH cloud positioning in terms of being uh, eco-friendly or whatever. They mean they are really going in depth in analyzing our model, the KPI uh, we, uh, we provide them with, our roadmap and so on and so forth. But more interestingly, let's take the other side of the spectrum. Let's talk about our suppliers, our tier one suppliers. They're willing to, uh, to be on board with us. I mean, just to give you concrete examples, whenever we have them sign a code of conduct in our supplying contracts, uh, they do sign it and they accept most of the clauses that we put inside. And they are very strict, those clauses, because there are some penalties at stake if they don't meet uh, some, uh, you know, specific, I wouldn't mention SLAs, but some specific KPIs in terms of uh, environmental impact. So it's the all overall ecosystem which is going that way. And if we look internally within the company, um, I see a huge traction at the employee level. I mean, there are so many initiatives coming from the people working within the company, um, uh, as far as, you know, common transportation use, uh, hybrid transportation capabilities, um, you know, using devices which are secondhand devices and so, so on and so forth. So I think it's globally the ecosystem which is moving in the good direction. Wow, okay. Uh, and as I'm talking to many of the customers, I mean, it's turning out to be really complex, interconnected in all sort of shape or form. So let's help our listeners understand why it is so difficult to make sense of all of this, Gregory. What's the OVH cloud thought process is on? Okay. So. That, that, that's probably the, um, the most important question. Um, how do you measure the environmental and impact of any given activity? Um, first thing, it's always multifactorial, right? You have to consider the impact on resources. You have to consider the impact on biodiversity, the impact on climate, uh, on health, and so on and so forth. Um, in order to simplify the way we look at the cloud service providers impact on the environment, I would recommend to focus on two main criteria. Uh, the first one would be, and it was mentioned already by David and Rory, 
would be uh, the what we call the carbon footprint, which is the uh, CO2 equivalent emissions, meaning the amount of greenhouse gases that we reject in the atmosphere on a year on a yearly basis. Okay. Um, and in order to understand better where those emissions are coming from, you have to refer to the way they are organized. They are organized in categories that we call scope. Scope one is the direct emissions. In our industry, scope one is related to the use of generators mostly. Okay, whenever there is an electrical cut on the grid uh, to make sure that the data centers would take over, uh, you have a backup which is running on gensets. Obviously, it happens not so often but it's less than 1% of the emissions, but still it has to be considered. The scope two is one of the biggest one. It's the indirect emissions, meaning the emissions coming from the use of electricity. I mean, cloud is about electricity in the end. We need electricity to run those bloody servers, right? And this electricity, depending upon the, the primary source uh, that created the electricity, the emission factor would change a lot. Consider, for example, some geographies like uh, Poland uh, because of the uh, geopolitics and the fact that they don't get access to natural gas coming from Russia. They have to increase the production of electricity coming from coal factory. Uh, this is very um, high in terms of emissions. On the other side, if you look at hydroelectricity in Canada or nuclear plants in France, this is very low emission. So again, scope two is very important. Uh, to be analyzed because there's a lot of differentiating factors to understand the impact. And ultimately, let's not forget about scope three, which are the downstream and upstream emissions. So in our industry, they are mainly driven by the manufacturing of the servers. And I really draw your attention on this one because very often our ecosystem, they forget about scope three. They only focus on scope one and two, but scope three, just to give you the idea the weight of scope three emissions within OVH cloud in full transparency is 55% of the global emissions. And just the server manufacturing accounts for 41% out of those 55%. So you see that this is a key element to be as well considered. The second criteria, criterion that should be looked at is the use of water. Why am I focusing on water? It's because most of the technology which are used in our industry to cool down the servers is relying on the on water consumption, okay? Um, for many reasons, it can be cooling towers on which you pour water uh, to make sure that you cool down the uh, the heat which is coming from the uh, from the data hole, which is mainly like a nuclear plant is working. Or if you use dry coolers, you need to use evaporative cooling during you know high temperature season like summertime in order to cool down a bit the flow of air which is going through the dry coolers and that water evaporates. Um, this is very important because um, if we look at, and this is a consequence of the climate change, the water scarcity, uh, what we call the hydric stress, is increasing. So it's another criteria you should look at, very important. Cool. Okay, so that's from our perspective of providing data centers and cloud services. Rory, now you're in the virtual uh, the hosted private cloud space. What's your take on how complex and interrelated all of this becomes? Well, I think, you know, that, that it's really important that we understand that when we're talking about cloud, we're talking about all types of cloud, right? So, so Gregory is, is naturally and rightly focusing on what we would broadly describe as public cloud services and public cloud provision. But the fact is, it's, it's all types of cloud. If you've got a you know, a data center that you've modernized a little bit, you've uh, maybe automated some of it using, you know, policies and governance, you've got a private cloud and you've got the same challenge. And we're seeing more and more of this starting to, to happen. We're getting resources that we consume at the edge of clouds, particularly through, through the telco space. So we've got a, a, a big discussion to have. And I just want to be really clear. It's not as if you can turn around and say, you know, if you're in David's 2% who are still completely on premises, you can't just bury your head in the sand and say, oh, it's somebody else's problem. It's our problem, right? And, and uh, I hate to sound like a schoolmaster, but, but I do want to get that across. As Gregory hinted at, it, this is broader than just carbon, right? There's, there's water consideration. There's the consideration around human resources and where we uh, locate our, our, our 
IT infrastructure, where we locate our businesses, where we consume resources from, what we encourage people to do. If you're Instagram and driving your users to upload videos, upload photographs, you know, a six second upload of a video to, to Instagram is the equivalent of, of boiling 60 litres of water. Now, we're not going to change that behaviour, certainly not in the short term. But if we can increase the awareness of it, we start to, to, to drive out the ability over time to make changes in how we do things. But the other pieces that, that, that come into this are things like um, local emergency microgrids. So one of the things that, that we at VMware have done is we've worked uh, at our headquarters in Palo Alto in California. We've worked with a local city to create a, a microgrid where we store energy and, and uh, particularly electricity, but other types of energy on our campus. So if there is a local event, typically in that area, it's an earthquake or a uh, forest fire, we can provide power to the city for up to 48 hours to provide power for emergency services and emergency responses. Um, tree planting, you know, we, we as an organization, uh, you and David were both at, at the cloud event a couple of weeks ago. I was in bed with COVID and decided not to go and infect everybody. I wasn't in bed, but I was stuck at home with COVID. Um, you know, it, it, you have that situation where you go to these events and you come away with a bag full of swag, you know, unless it's chocolate, it, it's really not worth it most of the time. You get home, you chuck it away. We've decided to stop doing that. When people come into our briefing centers, instead of giving them another notepad or a, you know, a pen or a whatever it might be, we plant a tree, we plant a tree in, in, you know, in their name. Um, so there's a range of different pieces that, that come into this. And it's a really, I think it's really important we recognize that it's more than just carbon output. Um, we then get to the point of how we measure it, but I think that's that's a that that's possibly a conversation or a topic for later in our conversation. Okay. Look, Elliot, you were gonna have to up our game uh, at the giveaways for future <laughs> events. So there you have it. Uh, David, what's your take on it? Well, um, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we as an organisation are big into research and, and, I'm, and I'm a ravenous uh, kind of collector of other people's research. Um, there's a, a piece from Accenture from a couple of years ago um, that uh, basically suggests, and, and this is all about, you know, with cloud, we're all about doing uh, doing more with less. And we're about um, the, the, economics, the economies you get from doing things at scale. So their, their research says uh, migration to the public cloud can achieve significant carbon reduction uh, and decrease in total in it total emissions of nearly 60 million tons of carbon dioxide globally which is a hell of a big number and then further on in the report it talks about how uh you know shifting to public, uh, public cloud done right you're talking about um 30 to 40 percent reduction in 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 total costs so, from my, uh, from my, from my point of view, it's not, as, as, the, as the other guys said, it's, it's not just about the carbon, but however, uh, those, those numbers highlight the importance of, of, of cloud to helping out in this sustainability topic. Okay, so let, let's address one thing before we go to the next bit of chocolate tasting from Nick. Um, this is complex, you've just painted the picture of how complex it is, but in terms of therefore proving those sustainability credentials, uh, you know, give our listeners some pointers on what they should look out for when they look to their suppliers to measure this complex area. So, Rory, you want to kick off with that one? Yeah, um, I, I will, Kuldi, because look, you know, we're we're a large organisation ourselves. You know, we are. Um, 13 billion dollars in revenue. We're about 40,000 people worldwide. If you include, you know, contractors and what have you, it, you know, it, it's chunky. Um, and we have, I think, at last count, 70 uh, pools of infrastructure. Be they our own data centers, clouds, etc. We're we're a user of cloud, so we put out a lot of carbon, and we make a lot of noise about how much carbon we have saved our customers and that's true yeah. but we also have to be conscious of our own operations you know we have thousands of developers working on uh, the products that that we you know uh, supply to to our customers uh, every day 
they're spinning up containers. They're using virtual machines, some of them on our own premises, some of them uh, in, in public clouds from, from our cloud partners, including yourselves. Um, and we have to, to be smart about this. So a number of years ago, we started with a couple of things. We, uh, we mandated to our development teams that sustainability and equity are non-negotiably topics that are top of the list at the very first meeting when you start to discuss either a new product or a new iteration, new version of a product. You just have to have that in there. We've changed the language we use, uh, you know, and all of that, but we're not, we're not talking about equity and, uh, and diversity in this conversation, but sustainability is in there, right? So if you can reduce your resource usage, you will do so. Um, you know, you and I have talked in the past about the fact that uh, I, I think it was probably about 15 years ago, uh, an engineer at a cloud provider, one of the world's large hyperscalers, um, came up with a way to reduce the power consumption of the servers by one watt. And that resulted in massive carbon saving. It also saved them $250 million a year, which I'm sure they were rather happy to have. Um, but, you know, th there is a whole range of different pieces. So uh, one of the things that, that we've had to do is, is how do we measure this, right? Because you don't know if you're doing right and doing well unless you can say, here's what I'm outputting today. I do X, Y, and Z, and here's what I output tomorrow, and have I got better or have I got worse? So we developed for our own use um, a, a set of tools and, and dashboards that measure the usage of your data center resources. And Nick, if you wouldn't mind chucking up uh, a slide on measurement. Oh, brilliant. Almost as if we'd planned it. Um, you know, so so uh, it's possibly a little bit difficult even with my glasses on to see the detail, but uh, suffice to say that, you know, we have been offering our customers the ability to measure their usage of resources um, for about 11 years now, 11, 12 years. And, and we've refined that so that you can now take a look at how much of your estate are you actually using? How much of your resources are being wasted? Uh, what we would call workload efficiency. You know, do you have a whole bunch of server capability, uh, VMs, containers, bare metal, don't care what, sitting there unused because that's wasteful because it's still powered on. You're still cooling it. Um, so, so, you know, looking at the rate at which you use your resources, whether on premises or in the cloud, giving customers the ability to measure that, understand that, snapshot that, and most importantly, to then uh, predict future state. If I do X, here's what I'm going to use. Initially, you know, we started doing that purely so that people could plan what uh, servers they would need to buy or what cloud resources they'd need to reserve. Um, but then, you know, it was a simple step from there onwards for our own internal teams and then obviously rolled out to our customers to say, if I roll up, you know, roll out a new project that requires these resources, this is the carbon impact I'm going to have. And, and one of the you know, biggest things that people raise to me all the time is this question around measurement. And that's why I make such a big deal of it. And, and you know, uh, I'm hammering the point home. What I'd like to see, um, you know, we're seeing already, particularly with larger organizations, we're seeing commitment at the board level to achieve measurable goals versus what we saw three years ago, which frankly, most of the time was greenwashing. And I'd love to see that filter down to, to smaller organizations to give them that ability. Cool. Okay. Uh, Gregory, what about your perspective on uh, measurements? I think we've got the wrong uh, items being displayed, by the way. Yeah, that's true. Some things on screen there, Nick, which uh, I think you... Ah, okay, you went back on the slide. Fixed. Hey. Okay, Gregory, what's your take? What is and you're so talking hard? on mute again. Is it better now? That's it. Now we okay. can. Hear Sorry you. about that, but it's unintentional, right? Um, so I would like to get back to your question, which is why is it so hard to prove sustainability credentials? It's not hard at all. It's, it's piece of cake. It's just a matter of willing to do so. 
Let me give you a number of examples. In order to measure the impact on the environment, you can rely on some very uh, well-known and spread KPIs, such as, for example, uh, the PUE, the power usage effectiveness. That measures the efficiency globally of the data center because you take into account the global uh, power, that, the global energy you need to feed your data center divided by the power you need at the workload level to run the servers, okay? This KPI is easy to calculate. It says it has been normalized, it has been standardized. There are some ISO standards that you can reflect upon. It should always be measured over 12 months, rolling 12 months, because obviously if you calculate your PUE in winter time in February, it will be very low. You have to consider as well the summer period where you use more cooling to cool down the system, okay? So PUE, again, it's a good way to be objective in, in the measurement. Again, you measure only one thing, which is the power efficiency. Second one is the WUE. We talked about water. So let's measure the amount of water that you need to cool down the server. Again, it's a common KPI. It's, 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 it's easy to calculate. Just have to measure the water that you use and divide it by the amount of energy you need to run your servers. So it's liter per kilowatt hour. So let me give you some figures just to illustrate the point. The average PU in the industry is at 1.55. These are the latest figures from 2022, 1.55. Thanks to our unique water cooling technology with InnoVH, we are at 1.28. Easy to compare. 1.28 is way below 1.25, and it has some benefits on scope two emissions, as I was mentioning before. Let's focus on WUE, the water usage effectiveness. The average industry is 1.8 liter per kilowatt hour with a vast, a vast spread between the lowest value and the highest value. If you consider cooling towers, for example, they can use up to six, eight liters per kilowatt hour. If you use only mechanical chilli chillers, uh, they won't need water, but they will need a, a lot of electricity to run, and then your WUE is zero. It's, it's a trade-off. Average industry, 1.8 liter per kilowatt hour. Thanks to our cooling technology, we are at 0 0.2, 0 0.26 liter per kilowatt hour. Again, easy to benchmark, and so on and so forth. You can as, as well, you know, have a close attention to what's called the REF. Again, it's a normalized uh, index. It's the, uh, um, you know, a way to measure the, uh, um, the, 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 the portion of your energy mix, which is low carbon. It's the re renewable energy factor, REF. Again, easy. The goal is to be 100% low carbon. Today with NovH Cloud, we are at 77% and we've made the commitment to be at 100% by 2025. Again, very easy to measure. So again, in that maze of really assessing the impact on the environment of a given activity, you can rely on some solid KPIs as long as they are accurate and they are properly uh, calculated. Cool. Uh, David, your take before the chocolate tastings. I'll be quick, but I just want to chip in one thing. That, uh, there's a really important thing that Rory said about the 1%. That reminded me of um, Dave Browsford, the performance director at the 20, for cycling at the 2012 Olympics, and his thing uh, about marginal gains, where when you break down the whole chain and, you, and you, you make marginal gains in every step, it turns out that you, you propel uh, British cycling to be number one in the world. Um, which is really important. But on the measurement thing, I would say that uh, uh, the one thing I'd add is just because you're outsourcing your IT to a cloud provider, that doesn't mean to say that you take, it takes away responsibility from, from measuring it properly. So, so it's a matter of choosing a, a, provi a provider that's, that's covering the metrics, that's actually giving the information so that you can actually monitor this and, 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 and present the right picture to the marketplace. Good point. Yeah, you can't derogate your responsibility. Okay, so now we're going to go to the next polling question, and we'll do the, the chocolate tasting. So the polling question, are you able to measure the environmental footprint or the impact of your cloud? So I'd like your opinion on that, and over to you, Nick. Oh, thank you very much. I must say, I'm thoroughly impressed. It's quite breathtaking that, that like these conversations happen in the tech space. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed by it. Can I just take a quick aside? Rory, you mentioned a, a stat about uploading an Instagram video. I'd love to hear that again, if you don't mind, just because 
but that's a good one to have in the holster when talking about <laughs> sustainability. Okay, so so there's probably a good time to tell you, Nick, that I make up 80% of my stats on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but this one is true. Uh, <laughs> I, I just, look, I just go to David and ask him for the stats and he tells me. This one is, is apparently true. To upload a six second video to Instagram uses the same amount of energy as, as boiling 60 liters of water. And uh, that's before anybody views it, right? That's just you take a video and upload it. Uh, I think if, if, if 20 people view it, that's another 60 liters of water boiled. So we're boiling a lot of water. Um, and as, as Gregory's already told us, that takes a fair amount of energy, you know, it's, it's the equivalent to cooling it. it, takes energy to cool it, takes energy to heat it. Yeah, I mean, I find that absolutely breathtaking as a, as a statistic. But um, yeah, so I'm going to dive into talking about where chocolate comes from, which I think dovetails into the theme that we're discussing here, that we don't really often consider the scope of the journey between, we heard the phrase bean to bar sometimes, but we don't really know what that means. And I would wager if I asked you, where does chocolate come from? A lot of people in the audience might not have ever given it a moment's thought. I've asked lots of people that, and, and lots of people have said, until you asked me just now, I'd never really thought of it. It comes from Tesco, and that's about as far as people got, right? Um, but it's quite an interesting. It is a crop, and it's grown. The cocoa tree or cacao tree, it's native to the Amazon rainforest, but it grows quite happily in the tropics all around the world. You can see a map there of where it comes from. Almost all of the cocoa grown for our mass-produced chocolate, your Mars bars and Snickers and Kit Kats and whatnot, comes from Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa. And as you might imagine, in order to get cocoa from those places and turn them into a chocolate bar, it takes a lot of processing and a lot of logistics. And so we do have a lot of environmental impact. Um, but all of these things that happen on the origin of a, um, a, a, the origin of a cocoa tree ultimately also become the flavor of our chocolate. And if we go back to working on quality and fine flavor, the side effect of growing in a sustainable way, well, the side effect of growing for those things is sustainability and ethical production, as I'll talk about in just a second. But there's some wonderful pictures. That's a cocoa tree, if you've never seen one before. It has beautiful, tiny little ornate flowers, and they turn the fruit of the tree that we call cocoa pods. It's got a big, weird-looking alien egg kind of monster thing. Um, but a lot of the flavor of chocolate starts on the farm, which is why we should care about where our chocolate comes from. Because the product of, of, of what happens to cocoa is fermentation. You might not know that chocolate is a fermented food, like lots of fancy things, like alcoholic drinks and cheeses and sauerkraut and kimchi and whatever else. But fermentation that happens on the cocoa farm itself that lays the basic building blocks of what becomes chocolate's flavor. And we're gonna do a little experiment that's gonna connect us to cocoa origins by trying two different chocolate bars together. Actually, you've got the kind of sample pieces in your, in your kit there. And the first one we're gonna try is you should have a little bag of buttons from original beans. So that's the equivalent of, uh, uh, of the bar that you can see on the screen there. It's 75% uh, purer. You're looking for the kind of hot pink label you've got, a little bag of buttons. So that's the next chocolate that we're gonna try, but I'd like you to have on standby, the next one, which is another one from Original Beans, which is the Virunga 70, which is the kind of dark purple little rectangle you've got. So you're looking for two from Original Beans, the Pura 75 and the Virunga 70. Now we're gonna start with the Pura. So take one of those buttons and go through the same process that, you've already, that we've already established. You're all chocolate tasting experts now, of course. Um, so you don't have to hold your nose if you don't want to, but be mindful that you're on a journey with that chocolate. And from the moment it goes in your mouth, just try and think about what you're experiencing and try and capture it on, in words. And on Menti, on your, your phone or wherever you're answering your polls, capture some of those words and stick them onto, onto Menti and it will create a word cloud. While you're thinking about those flavors, I'm going to quickly summarize what original beans are all about, because they're a really important craft chocolate maker. Now, they're a very multinational uh, uh, endeavor. They're founded by a German guy, but their base of operations is in Switzerland, but they run all their admin out of the Netherlands, and then they source all their cocoa from the tropics all the way around the world. So it's a complicated outfit. But something that's interesting about original beans is that they are entirely, and I never get this, I'll be corrected by one of the panelists, I'm sure. They're either carbon negative or carbon positive. I forget which way round is the good one. But essentially, 
the farming techniques that they encourage on the, the places where they source their cocoa, um, the tree plantation and the agroforestry that they encourage and develop uh, covers the emissions of their entire supply chain up to uh, retailing the bars, which is quite a remarkable endeavor, really. Um, but we're looking here at cocoa that's come originally from the Pura Valley in northern Peru, which has quite a particular flavor profile. I'm hoping that if I give you a couple more seconds, there'll be some words will start to emerge that start to kind of, we'll kind of probably find a little bit of a consensus about some of the key building blocks of the flavor of this bar. Um, because this is made from a type of cacao called Gran Porcelana, which is a kind of quite rare type of cocoa that's, that's native to this part of Peru. Um, but it's also grown in a particular microclimate that enhances its flavor. So in the same way we talk about wine's terroir, which is to do with the, the soil nutrients where the, the plants grow, the local weather patterns, even the neighboring vegetation, all of that influences the chemistry of the fruit that becomes the flavor of our chocolate. And so we're gonna look, and what I hope was we'll see that these two chocolates, when you try them right next to each other, <coughs> give you quite different flavor experiences. So we got rich. So, so this might be kind of a new experience, right? This might be chocolate that's kind of punching at a level that you haven't tried before, especially if you're only used to kind of milky bars and dairy milks and things like that. Paul, call, call me a bit of a Luddite, but uh, I don't know how to pour words onto the screen. How do I do that? What's the process for that? Or is that on the phone? Yeah, on your phone, on your second device. Ah, I got there you. should be just some fields where you can pop words in there. Got um, you. And yeah, and there's no wrong yeah. answers. It's whatever that is meaningful for you and your personal experience. Nick, can you just say again what you said about the two chocolates together? Because I've had my first button, it was lovely, but I don't know sure. what I'm supposed to do with the second bit. So just hold on for a second, gather your thoughts about that flavour and share your thoughts if you want on Tementi, if, you, if you're willing to. And we're going to compare the flavours of the two when we get to the next one. Um, but there's some good keywords. So I'm particularly interested that orange and lemon have come up because I think this bar has a certain sort of tartness and sourness and sharpness to it. It's what we would say it's very bright. For me, I mean, they say it on the packaging, I think, somewhere, but maybe not on this one. But for me, it's raspberry. I get notes of raspberry that's got that kind of tartness and sharpness, but it's also sweet and juicy, and raspberry is just a word for me that captures all of that. But I think some people are capturing a bit of that sharpness and tartness and brightness with lemon, like it's citrusy, right? It's fruity, but it's fruity like citrus rather than fruity like plums or or more floral like peaches and things like that. Anyway, I would like you to just kind of log that up in your memory, uh, log that up in, I was gonna say in your memory banks, but I think that's a very old fashioned technical term. I would say, but store that in your servers or whatever for this crowd and then reset your palate with a sip of water or something like that or whatever it is that you're drinking. And now let's move on to the Virunga 70. That's the dark purple one. Exactly the same process, have a taste, enjoy it, be in the moment. I like to praise kind of mindful eating when we're doing chocolate tasting. So really be with that chocolate and try and see what words emerge. And what I hope is we're having quite a different experience here because this is the same chocolate maker making the chocolate in the same way, in the same place, but with cocoa beans from an entirely different part of the world. The cocoa for this chocolate comes from Virunga in Eastern Congo which you may be familiar with because the Virunga National Park is where you find mountain gorillas, one of the last places in the world you find mountain gorillas. Uh, and all of the beans for this, this chocolate bar have been grown in villages on the outskirts of the Virunga National Park, supported through agroforestry schemes at Original Beans Fund to grow this very different type of cocoa. And there's loads of different stories when you focus on origin, loads of different processes. So here we're talking about communities that have been destroyed by war, being rebuilt by developing sustainable agricultural skills, particularly in women who've been left behind where men have been killed in the fighting, in an extremely environmentally and biodiverse kind of sensitive environment. And here, cocoa solves a lot of these problems. Cocoa, I'll get onto it maybe a bit later, but cocoa is a miracle crop in the way that it can be grown sustainably, ethically, and profitably, really importantly, that kind of triple bottom line grows out of the ground when it comes to cocoa. 
But in terms of flavor, the way we access and start to unpack all these things is think about flavor. So I'm hoping that you're getting quite a different experience out of this bar. And that maybe it doesn't quite have that sharpness and tartness. It's a bit broader, a bit, what have we got? So it's bitter more than smooth. If we're starting out on taste, velvet is a good way to, velvet is a good way to go one step further than smooth. I think so, I mean, smooth is not wrong, right? But there's a good challenge to say, well, is it smooth because it's velvety or silky or buttery or creamy in a different direction? A bit of saltiness, so if someone's getting the kind of savory edge of it a little bit there. Is it maybe sweeter, a bit more caramel? Um, for lack of a better term, I think this chocolate is a bit more chocolatey, which sounds a bit of a clumsy way to say it, but this chocolate is more closely related to this, um, like the type of chocolate that flavors that make up the bulk of mass-produced cocoa. It's obviously a different league, but if there's some sort of family resemblance in there, I think, because we have a common understanding of what we think chocolate is supposed to taste like, and this is closer to that. Um, so I'll give it a couple more seconds. Um, but the, the key kind of takeaway that I wanted you to think about really was that these two chocolates have nothing else in them other than cocoa beans and sugar, literally no other ingredients. <clears throat> so any difference in flavor that you've teased out of it is a difference in the flavor of the cocoa itself. And that comes, that's our reward if we care about flavor and, and care about our own personal sort of sensory experiences. But what you're really tasting is that importance of caring about origin caring about the people and places that, that are the kind of starting point of a really quite amazing supply chain that puts chocolate and, in your mouth and gives you that experience. And the problem is modern chocolate does away with all of that. Mass-produced chocolate focuses on uniformity, standardization, all driven by price, and no other considerations really come into it. And the word greenwashing was already mentioned, and if they ever write the textbook on greenwashing, chocolate should get like half the chapters. It's quite a remarkable sector in terms of how greenwashing is. Um, but again, conscious of time, I'll skip back to the poll. Oh, uh, I'll tell you, what, I'll just highlight earthy because I think that's a good word. Earthy, nutty, and woody would be words in the circle to my mind. Kind of a bit broader, mellower sort of flavors. Um, yeah, I'll go back to the poll. Zoom back through time here. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you to kind of discuss that. Okay. So it looks like. There's a few folks who are saying having a clue and some parts of it, which is what we anticipated, I think, in our discussion. There's a couple of folks who've said, yes, we track it clearly. Now, that I'll be interested to find out more. So expect us to reach out. It'd be useful if you put into the chat some of the techniques you use to share with the other listeners and with the panel how you are actually measuring all of this. Um, but underpinning all of this is all that innovation taking place. Gregory, you've mentioned a lot of innovation and how OBH are, are handling the sustainability. How are you using the innovation angle to drive your agenda? Okay, so um, so basically we, we talked about the, the, the benefit of our water cooling technology um, that will bring down the uh, PUE. Uh, while keeping a WE which is very low, um, it always it can always be improved. Um, what we are currently working on these days is to go the route of what we call the hybrid cooling, uh, which is mixing the water cooling technology as we do it with immersive cooling, and taking benefit of the fact that um, all the calories that you do not collect via an airflow. You would collect it via the dielectric fluid, which is way better in terms of efficiency. Uh, so this is one of the stuffs that we are currently working on. Uh, we have applied for more than 16 patents. Um, again, I don't want to overwhelm you with figures, but the way you measure the efficiency of such system is by going the route of the partial PUE, which is the one only related to the energy you consume to cool down your servers. Um, with this type of system, uh, you, can, uh, you can go down as low as uh, 1.001, meaning that you use 0.1% of the energy to cool down your system. So that's really uh, the, the growl. That's the ultimate goal. Okay, so that's number one. Um, the number two technology that we are trying to leverage 
is the fact that in the way we source energy on the market, we are trying to decarbonize as much as we can the, the energy mix. And for that sake, we are uh, really signing long-term agreements, what we call corporate power purchase agreements, uh, to commit on the uh, supply of energy over the next five to 10 years, uh, with a little bit of over oversubscription to make sure that we cover 100% of our needs. And obviously, as you can e easily understand, we are, we are a, um, a 24 by seven uh, process industry, right? Uh, and if we, if we invest in a solar plant, this will only generate electricity at daylight. If we invest in a wind farm, we will have uh, some times where the wind is blowing like crazy and sometimes where there is no wind. So in order to, uh, uh, to make it flat, uh, we need to diversify the sources, but we have as well to investigate the route of storing energy. And, and this is a part of the industry which is making a lot of um, new development these days uh, in the ability to store energy, meaning that if you oversubscribe in a, let's say, uh, in, a, in a wind farm or in a, in a solar panel, you can store a bit of this energy so that at, the, you know, at night time or when the wind is not blowing, you can recover the energy that you have stored in the first place. So there are a bunch of technology levers that we are looking at that will help us uh, obviously going down uh, and, and, and improve uh, again the situation. Cool. Okay. Uh, what about you, Rory, from VMware's perspective? Measurement. Innovation. Well, look, with better measurement tools, you get better decision making. So one of the things we've done for a couple of decades now is offer a solution that by happy accident was uh, uh, was sustainable. Um, you know, we started off by helping customers virtualize servers that were running at shockingly low levels of utilization. And then we moved that uh, to the entire data center and then onwards to the cloud. So, you know, David was saying that if, if, if we get really smart around the world and, and you know, use cloud effectively, then we'll save about 60 million tons of CO2. Um, in the last 15 years, we've saved 1.2 billion tons of CO2 using those solutions. So it's a good start. Uh, it's awesome. good, you know, it's, it, it, it's an important piece. And what we're doing is we're partnering ever more closely with on-premises manufacturers, uh, four and a half thousand cloud providers around the world, organizations like OVH Cloud, small specialist cloud providers, all the major hyperscalers. And, and we're sharing expertise, helping with measurement. Um, you know, we don't have all the answers, but it's, it, it, you know, we have some of them. We can share them with, with others and we hear back from you. Um, and it's all about this drive towards measuring and impacting ultimately the scope three emissions. We partner also, I, I was delighted to hear Gregory mention, you know, the, the kind of uh, work that OVH has done with suppliers. So we introduced about six years ago, um, sustainability requirements, in fact, full ESG requirements into our um, discussions with any prospective supplier, uh, you know, and, and again, we've had exactly the same experience, you know, where, where initially there was a bit of a discussion to be had. Now there's almost no pushback at all. People are happy to sign up to this um, and, and we're working towards, you know, a, an overall better future for all of us. Uh, so that's suppliers, hardware partners, soft, independent software vendors, it's uh, cloud providers, it's resellers, um, and, and increasingly it's with customers. I see the barriers being broken down and this being much more collaborative. Um, we're public about this, so I don't know, Nick, if you can grab my 30 by 30 slide, uh, but something we've done for some time, so we had that initial uh, push towards being, net, uh, being uh, carbon neutral, um, we set that goal in 2015, uh, we achieved it, in, we said we'd be carbon neutral by 2020, we achieved it in 2018, and then of course it's what's next. So, you know, we have uh, set and published 30 goals, 10 in each of the areas of sustainability, equity and trust, uh, that we will achieve by 2030. Some of them we certainly hope to achieve long before then, but that's the deadline. 
And that's public. And we, we, we are very open. We publish a report each year about how we're doing, what progress we've made, what challenges we hit. Um, and I think that's really important that, that you know, the whole ESG piece and in, in the context of our discussion today, sustainability is absolutely integrated into everything we do. Wow. Okay. Now, I'm conscious you mentioned the word future and Gregory, you said you've got an eye on, on the future. Uh, everybody has a good think about those kinds of things. And one of the things that are coming over the horizon is this element of regulation, how we, uh, the governance piece that comes with it. So, David, you, you, we, you and I have talked about this in the past. What's your take on what's on the horizon in terms of regulation? Well, I, th I think um, the, the answer is not, not enough. I mean, if you um, uh, look at Bill Gates' recent book about um, how to avoid a climate disaster, I, I don't think the regulation is happening fast enough. Uh, and I think one of the things we can do is, is we can all lobby our governments. Every time there's a COP26, COP27, it's incredibly difficult to get a uniform agreement of, over that number of nations. And one of the great things out of uh, COP27 was actually um, more support for the smaller countries, the, the, the third world countries that are going to be most impacted by, by, by all, all of this and don't have the resources to to do things necessarily in the proper proper way. So I, I think we need to we all need to be lobbying our governments to, to, to go faster in terms of getting this right. Okay, yeah. Um, Rory, I mean, uh, you, you must have a view from VMware's perspective as to, you know, what you're doing is going to be sufficient to meet the regulatory oversight. Uh -huh. <laughs> there's a there's a conversation sufficient to meet regulatory oversight. Um, look, a couple of things. In my experience, commercial organisations are leading on this. Part of the problem in 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 you know, as David says, governments move slowly because most governments in most countries are only thinking about their term in office. Exactly. Uh, long term vision is is awfully short. Um, in in my experience, um, so we see we see commercial organizations leading on this very often driven by activist shareholders and as younger generations start to become shareholders we're going to see that happen uh, we see the sentiment of our customers changing and uh, i think gregory mentioned it as well we're seeing that the the impetus come inside organizations i know that certainly at vmware our own employees are driving corporate behavior really strongly you know we have a bunch of what we call pods, power of difference communities, which are just employee groups, you know, driving towards more sustainability in their geographical area. Uh, plenty of pods in other areas as well. We need now to bring governmental and regulatory agencies along with us. They are by definition traditional organizations that tend to look backwards. Um, we have successfully done this for a lot of the move to cloud. Uh, you know, particularly in educating governmental regulators, industry regulators, that that they need to understand that workloads don't behave like they used to. They move, they change, uh, and they need to apply regulatory principles to them that that take that into account. I think Europe's further along than any other region, but we're all going to have to pull together. One specific I'd mention, and I'm conscious uh, of time as we do this, Gulib, so I'll be quick. Uh, we're seeing a trend, particularly across our region in, in Europe, towards sovereign cloud. And sovereignty, uh, typically most people think of it purely as, as a geographic thing, but it's about a lot more than that. It's about understanding where your data is located. It's about understanding the, com, you know, the, the carbon impact of that data. It's a, about understanding who holds it, what access they have it, how many copies are available. Um, and I think we're going to see some benefit come from, from the whole sovereign cloud uh, initiative that frankly, only started about four or five years ago. Well, when it comes to sovereign, you're obviously talking to companies taking it seriously. Gregory, what's your take on the regulatory stuff? Well, I, I wouldn't be as pessimistic as Rory. I mean, if, if I look at the numbers of, uh, you know, uh, regulation initiatives, uh, it's, it's becoming crazy. I mean, if you look at the European level, just to name one of them, the, uh, the European Code of Conduct, which is really taking uh, taking uh, 
uh, a major step these days because it's going to be the um, stepping stepping stone for the green taxonomy, which is going to become a, a massive incentive moving forward to be greener than we used to be. So uh, I, I see at the government levels, at the local level, and at the uh, I would say at the European level, if, if we look at this uh, level of organization, I see a huge traction in the way they want to organize data sharing, transparency, reporting, and then eventually regulation. But now if I look, in, if I look at it in a different way, look at the numbers of self-regulation initiatives from the industry. And again, just to illustrate my point, uh, let's talk about the Climate Neutral Data Center Pact. Again, it's not imposed by anyone. It's just the industry trying to be better than they used to be because they know that they have to, uh, to, 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 to go that route. Okay. And obviously, uh, if you look at the customer behavior, I mean, they, they, they are putting so much pressure in the way they assess their suppliers that this is a form of regulation. It's, it's, it's a regulation coming from the market. And my last point would be, there's a kind of regulation coming from the scientists because now they can advocate their point because they are being heard. They were not heard in the past, but now they are being heard. Look at an example. We are, we are talking in, in, in depth about the carbon footprint. There is something which is really booming these days, which is the science-based target initiative, SBTI. It's nothing else than a, a pure standard coming from scientists, and it's imposing. And, and, and I think it's, uh, these are good signals that we are going in the good direction. Well, there's a lot to, even more to unpack, but we're going to be out of time if we do so. So, uh, Nick, if you throw up the last polling question, let's ask the folks as to where they are with their sustainability. How do you encourage that during the procurement process? So we have three potential answers. Uh, you've got KPIs built in. Uh, for your operation that you build into your procurement approach. You don't have any KPIs, but have a preference. Or you might be in the boat of you really do care about sustainability, but you make purchase decisions on other criteria. So it'd be interesting to gauge your opinions. While you do that, um, Nick, I'm going to, in, uh, for the purposes of of time, uh, I'm going to go through to each of the panelists to give one large nugget of information that they would draw from uh, all that they said. Uh, what is the one tip or nugget that you would like to share with the listeners? So, David, over to you first. What's that nugget? My, my nugget is that, and this comes from um, some um, more Accenture research, um, taking this approach with getting ESG and sustainability right makes business sense. Um, it says here, uh, uh, the concrete sustainable goals are more likely to be rewarded by the market. Companies with consistently high ESG performance tended to score 2.6 higher on total return to shareholders. So it's good business. There you have it. Nice and punchy. Rory, what's yours? Um, well, you might have heard me mention measurement. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to say measure. You know, do, do this scientifically, do this accurately. Uh, understand your journey to cloud or in using cloud. Um, make that assessment, you know, don't rush headlong to cloud. You know, we're still hearing way too much of we're cloud first. Yeah, but why? Um, and as you make the decision about where your workloads live and where your new applications are developed today, roughly 75% cloud, 25% on-prem, make that decision using an additional criteria that perhaps wasn't part of it before. And that criteria is sustainability, but measure, measure, measure. Excellent. Okay, Gregory, what you? Yeah, and measure, and I would say compare. And in order to compare, make sure that the measurements that were proposed by the suppliers are reliable. That that would be my my nugget. Make sure that you understand the way they measure. They are talking about carbon emission. Simple question: Do you measure all scopes? If they don't measure it, 
forget about it. I've, I've talked about some KPIs which are easy to compare, PUE, WUE, REF, very easy. Make sure that they, they are measured correctly and then you can compare. And once you've compared, make up your, make up your mind. Cool, okay. So thank you very much for that. Uh, the polling uh, looks like, and this is this is quite hardening because there's nobody in much as we care about sustainability or uh, about sustainability, but the procurement decision isn't based on it. So there's nobody in that camp. So uh, either they've got KPIs or there's a preference, which is really heartening for us. So thank you very much for that. Now. Really big thanks to the panelists, David, Rory, and Gregory. So thanks for that. There were three points that really grabbed me while you were talking. Um, I think the first was this isn't just about carbon. It's about the water consumption, the end-to-end -end value chain, and that includes whether it's hardware, the software, your customers, suppliers. So I think that's number one. I think number two, if you're a pro, if you have uh, approached it in the right way, sustainability can naturally come from, I think is the term frugality you used in one of your uh, answers, Gregory, uh, and that leads to cost savings naturally. And that can be passed on to customers, so that works. And number three, don't wait for the legislation. There's plenty now, but you don't have to wait for it to come along. Start now. And you'll not only be helping the planet, but you'll also start to save money straight away. Okay, so a bit about the admin before coming to the final chocolate tasting. In case you want to listen to some parts again, or hopefully share with your colleagues, this discussion has been recorded and you will be sent an email by NADR events manager that signposts where that is. Uh, the email that contains links to some additional resources as well. Uh, and it can help you take advantage of the services we've talked about today and will help you with your hardware crowd journey. Uh, a shameless plug, as I said at the start of the call, OVH Cloud and VMware are in partnership, and we provide market-leading hosted private cloud solutions, and you can have these dis uh, solutions deployed in sovereign clouds in a secure way, and because of our low price points and transparency, you, the customer, can get great value. So uh, it's well worth having a conversation about that. Please do get in touch if you think we can help. And in any case, expect a call from us to understand your projects and whether we can help you in any way. Now, the final thing that made an impression on me, uh, it's one of the points made in the Panorama program. Uh, I think we all have to take responsibility for the digital footprint we leave in the cloud. And that means we keep to a minimum the files, the photos, and whatever else we are responsible for creating, whether that's at a personal level or as business executives. So I think that, that part is really important that we all play, play our part in it. So for the last few minutes of the call, I'm going to pass back to you, Nick, to do that whistle stop finale through the chocolates and maybe you can then conclude your description of those chocolates thank you Lucky. brilliant um yeah that's really that's had a bit of an impact on me i must say as well as someone who spends a lot of time agonizing over things in the supermarket and looking at labels worrying about what my impact is but to be honest i don't really think twice when i'm uploading a million pictures of my kids in a play park or whatever you know about what my impact is there and so that's the, I'm, that's, that's, I'm going to take that away and, and have a think about that. That's actually quite impactful to me. Um, but yes, yeah, so to conclude on uh, the chocolate, I'm going to take a whistle-stop tour through the history of chocolate and try and figure out how we started off in these kind of uh, the amazing origins of, of chocolate in the ancient world to the kind of the absolute worst case scenario that we have for mass-produced chocolate in the modern world. But it's a very ancient uh, type of thing. Cocoa was being consumed maybe as early as 3500 bc by people who lived amongst cocoa trees but they made a drink out of it a kind of spicy savory broth thing that was very different than what we think of as modern chocolate and through all sorts of uh, uh, largely colonial activity um 
chocolate consumption or cocoa consumption moved from uh, South and Central America, where it was native, to Europe and North America, uh, although the cocoa still had to come from uh, the tropical parts of the world, of course. Um, the, long, the long story short version of it is that it was actually the, the European church, the medieval church, that wanted people to drink cocoa because they had an army of missionaries in the, in the New World looking for a market for this crop that the locals were growing. Um, but when cocoa came to Europe, um, it was still drank, but people drank it with um, uh, milk and sweetened it with sugars, and it starts to resemble what we think of as chocolate today. But the problem is that cocoa is very, very fatty, and the natural fat in cocoa doesn't dissolve very well. Now imagine if you took a spoonful of butter and put it in a mug of hot water, Imagine the absolute state that would leave inside that mug and trying to drink that with bits of it sticking to your face and also but that was what drinking chocolate used to be like. Um, and that was a problem for early modern gentlemen like the picture of the portrait you see there with very fine beards and big frilly ruffs around their neck and powdered wigs with bows on and puffy blouses and anything else you can imagine. They were getting the fat from cocoa stuck to their faces and clothes at such a rate that it was creating a real, a genuine crisis of fashion that led to an economic need to solve it. And this led to the invention of the cocoa press, which squeezes cocoa to separate out the fat and the dry cocoa mass. And you can use the cocoa fat today, we call it cocoa butter, you can use it for skin creams and whatever. And the cocoa mass is a powder that we make drinks out of today. But in 1847, a guy called Joseph Fry came up with a recipe for recombining the two elements in a different ratio. And what he invented was a, a material that is a stable solid at room temperature. And that's the invention of the chocolate bar. So 1847 that was, that is a pretty modern creation really in the scheme of things. And the next chocolate I'd like you to try will give you a glimpse into that, that history. Now this, curious enough that it's a circular chocolate, but the disc that you've got in your kit from Taza, that is a, uh, a modern chocolate, it's not 150 years old, but it's made much more recently than that, but using similar processes to the original chocolate bars. So open this one up and have a taste. And what I'm hoping you will discover is that uh, chocolate has changed a lot in its history. This will give you an example of what chocolate used to be like, and it will challenge your expectations of what you think modern chocolate should be. Not everyone enjoys this on their first go because it's weird, because it's different. Mm -hmm. But there's some phenomenal Dominican Republic cacao in there. It's been loosely stone ground so that you can turn it into a chocolate, but it's still you can maintain the physical kind of texture of the dried and roasted cocoa beans themselves. So that's what you're feeling. I think it's quite good because it helps connect you a little bit more with the origin of cocoa, it makes it seem a bit more tangible. This chocolate's quite an abstraction from a, from a plant growing in a forest in the, in the tropics somewhere. This makes that a bit more tangible, I think. But we experienced a flavor quite different here. There's a very different texture. The way the sugar touches our tongue directly uh, as, as sugar crystals, rather than being a kind of uniform consistency, means the way that we experience the sweetness compared to the rest of the flavor profile is slightly different. And if you're not a fan of weird grainy chocolate, then as chocolate progresses through history, certain other things happen in its, in its production that make it, uh, that, that change it to what we're more used to. So most of these developments then happen in Switzerland. And we owe a big part of it to the guy on the left there, and that's Rodolf Lindt. Lindt is obviously a name that we still associate with chocolate. Um, and uh, the modern Lindt chocolate is pretty far removed from what Lindt was doing in a little workshop in Switzerland. But he invented or discovered uh, that if you keep grinding cocoa um, finer and finer and finer, it eventually liquefies and creates this liquid molten cocoa you can then temper back to a solid that is smooth and consistent. And so that's the invention of dark, smooth chocolate as we know it today. And Lindt discovered that by accident by leaving a machine on for too long, essentially. Um, and the next step in chocolate's history, we attribute to the guy in the middle of the row there, that is Henri Nestlé, another name that we still associate with chocolate and lots of other things as well. But his whole uh, fortune was made in milk products, like powdered milk, condensed milk, evaporated milk, that's a baby formula as well. But it was his neighbor and friend, Daniel Peter, on the right there. He came up with the idea of taking some of Nestle's milk powder and introducing it to a chocolate conch, which is what uh, Lindt invented, the conching machine, to fuse cocoa and milk together. Now, obviously, now we know that was a pretty good idea. Um, and Daniel Peter invented what we would call milk chocolate. 
Uh, but Nestle gets all the credit because Nestle had all the milk and that's how history is written, I suppose. The next chocolate I'd like you to try is our first milk chocolate. So this is from Original Beans again, um, the maker we talked about earlier. It's the light blue little one that you've got in your kit there. Um, and it's a 42% Esmeraldas. Now, 42% cocoa content is much lower than the previous bars that we've tried um, because they've been darks and they're up in the 70s. Um, but in the UK, to label something as a milk chocolate, it needs to contain 20% cocoa. And this is nearly double that, of course. So, um, so we've got plenty of opportunity for uh, lots of cocoa flavor. I should say all the mass produced chocolate is, of course, you know, at 20% because obviously that's you, know, you make it as cheap as possible and you fill up the rest with palm oil and add flavorings to compensate for the poor quality. But here you've got great cocoa from Ecuador, which is tends to have quite a kind of green and vegetal kind of note to it, a bit herby and earthy, but balanced with milk and caramel and stuff like that. But I'm hoping you might have a different reaction to this chocolate. And then when you've had the previous chocolates, you've kind of thought very intellectually about their flavor notes and you're kind of curious to try the next one and learn more of the story. Um, but here, maybe there's a little switch going off in your head that says, have a little bit more or oh, another little nibble, one more little taste, something like that. that's what we do with modern chocolate. Right. And it's because modern chocolate uh, activates what's called our bliss point. When you combine sugar, salt and fat in a certain ratio, it triggers this release of chemicals in our brain that make us happy in little bursts. And so, you know, naturally, when you do something that makes you happy, you want to repeat the action that did that for you. It's why when Pringles say once you pop, you can't stop. Like that's a fun marketing term, but there's actually millions of research dollars behind that of optimizing recipes, of, of, of encouraging certain consumption behavior in people. It's what defines snack food and junk food and fast food and, and whatever that you know, makes us happy and makes us feel good, right? Um, but when it comes to chocolate, it changed our relationship with chocolate from something which is about savoring fine flavors, caring about the craft and the journey from the tree through to the finished product. And it turned chocolate into an ingredient and a resource which is extracted from countries in the tropics as a, as a physical material and transformed in the cheapest and most efficient way possible into something that just activates your bliss point in your brain. And that's what modern chocolate has become and why we're so far removed from what, uh, what it can be. Now, obviously I've given the absolute high level whistle stop tour through all of this. And I'd encourage people to learn more because there are lots of really quite catastrophic problems um, tangled up uh, in, in, these, uh, in these issues. The picture there, you can see deforestation that, that is attributed to a lot of cocoa production in the tropics. Cote d'Ivoire, where about 70% of the world's cocoa is grown, uh, has lost over 90% of its rainforest in the last 25 years, um, almost entirely because of mass-produced cocoa production. Um, palm oil that goes into chocolate, of course, we could talk all day about. Um, and there's ethical dilemmas as well. If we keep thinking of chocolate as being cheap and as just being a, a, a low-price commodity snack, what we're doing is passing very real hidden costs onto people who can least afford them. So if I try rather clumsily to crowbar my message of sustainable ethical chocolate into what we've talked about today, thinking about the wider scope is really important. When you pick up a chocolate bar, look at the label, care about where the cocoa comes from, expect as a consumer, if you pay more for it, you get a better quality experience um, and demand the transparency and traceability so that you know that your money is well spent when you eat it. And your reward is you get the best possible chocolate in the world. And that's what we're trying to do in craft chocolate. And I hope I've given you a, a taste, as it were, for it. Um, and I could talk all day long for that. I'm conscious that we need to start wrapping up. So I'll blast through some of the, the slides. I'll, I'll mention what, what we're trying to do in craft chocolate, which is this direct trade model where chocolate makers, artisans and crafters source their cocoa beans directly from cocoa farmers on equitable contracts that are negotiated between both parties rather than on commodity pricing, where it's all about quality and uh, a premium experience and creating something for consumers which costs more, but is showing the real cost of that, uh, of that um, product. Um, anyway, I could proselytize all night long, and I'm conscious people have got uh, uh, things to be doing. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll blast through to the final slide uh, for these guys, um, and I'll leave open the slide as, as we close, where people can give feedback as well about the, about the session that's taking place. So, um, I know these guys would be really keen to get that. 
Okay, thank you very much, Nick. That was really good sharing you all the knowledge and the insight. It's incredible, isn't it? How many parallels we can draw between completely unrelated industries, and we've been talking about IT and cloud, but there you have similar sort of issues, different way, but chocolate as well. So it is, uh, it, it is really insightful, and some of the problems aren't going to go away unless we take active action. So thank you very much for that, Nick. Uh, please leave comments on what went well, what we could improve for future. Uh, use your phone to get those thoughts across to us. Just remains for me to say a big thanks to all of you for listening today. Enjoy your chocolate. I hope you learn lots in the process. Uh, we have a series of webinars and face-to-face -face events in the next three months. We'll send you details of those via email. And have a lovely rest of the evening. Enjoy your chocolates. Have a great Easter break in a couple of weeks' time when it arrives. And I hope to see you at the next event. Goodbye.